Hall. We have ladies prayer group. Wednesday night we have Bible classes for adults and kids, five to six. And not, uh, the next uh, youth youth and family night is going to be January the 19th, uh, 5:30 to 7:30. Secret Sisters are meeting the third Saturday of every month. And game night follows on Monday, uh, the Monday after. Uh, so January 20th. Uh, super excited because next week is potluck. <laughs> How many of you guys have not eaten enough in the last couple of weeks, right? We need to do more eating. Yes. But good. Good. So, uh, the reason, uh, of course, it falls on our second Sunday, but more than that, next Sunday on the 14th, um, we are going to be uh, establishing an eldership. And so I uh, want to encourage as many people as possible to be here uh, and then just be able to stick around for the potluck. Uh, so if you can, if you're able, I know there's football and all kinds of stuff that, that might be grabbing uh, your attention, but if, if you could peel away uh, for just a little while and uh, stick around for that, that would be awesome. Uh, we're going to try to figure out a, a thing so we kind of coordinate our meal, our dishes, uh, and, and get a good, good assortment. So uh, be looking for that. The other thing is, if you haven't been checking the weather lately, next week uh, it's supposed to get pretty cold down into the teens, 20s. And so we want to put an offer out. Uh, if there's anyone who needs help uh, getting your house ready, uh, covering up your, your outside spigots or uh, rocket pipes or anything of that nature, uh, bringing wood in or, you know, getting ready for for that cold, cold snap, uh, let us know. Uh, get over myself or the office or uh, somebody, Cisco. Uh, we want to be able to offer that and make sure that, that everyone is taken care of. If per chance something does happen, you, you can pray, um, please call. Um, you can come here, we'll figure it out, um, and we will help as best we can. But only help if we, if we know what, what to do. So uh, that offer is extended. I'm not aware of any other announcements. Is there any announcements that anyone else may have that need to be shared publicly? Okay then. All right, then let's get ready for why we are here. The big event. It's worship, man. We're here to worship God. So I hope that you're as excited as I am. Uh, today's going to be a great day of worship, I know, because you guys are great people, and God is awesome. And so, what could be a better combination than that? So, let's get ready to worship, clear out your mind, let all the other stuff fade away, and let's just spend the next bit of time working together. Praise God. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are with us. And that you're always with us. We can be here together with you. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we worship you. That's one of the things that we love to do. And we know that you enjoy that. We thank you. Pray that you'll be with us as we lift your name up in worship. We love you, Father. We have to give you Jesus.
Breathe on us and let us feel your peace and your love and your comfort. The only peace that is understanding is yours. And we need that today, Lord. Fill our hearts with warmth, with love, with forgiveness for each other. We want to be your servants, Lord. See us and hear us. Lord, we lift the Shaper family to you this morning. Many of us, well, many of us here and, and around the U.S. were greatly impacted by Mr. Mr. Schaefer. And I just pray that you will open your arms and welcome him to your, to your realm above, Lord. Look forward to the day of, of seeing him again, get a big old bear hug, like we used to. Lord, just be with their family. Lord, I pray that you be with Brittany this morning, Lord, as she is being attended by doctors and, and in pain or not in pain, Lord, that you know where she's at right now. We lift her up to you and, and pray for healing as only you can heal. Uh, there are many others that we ask for, and you hear our prayers, our, mur our murmurs, our mumblings, and the Holy Spirit is interceding for us in, in each of those, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit so that we may not have to say words that, that we may not know how to say or what to say, but you know exactly what we need. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us be your servants today. Let us be your servants this week. Help us to reach out to those that are around us that need our help. Let us reach out to those that need to hear your gospel and your, your story. Because it's through you that we are all can be saved. Let us be your example. Let us be your light in this community, Lord. We love you, Father. We just pray that you will help to continue to guide us. Give us the wisdom. Give us the Holy Spirit. Big amounts as we seek to install our elders, our leadership. Um, what a day that would be, Lord. And it's not that we haven't had it, Lord, but this is an exciting chapter. And I just pray that you will help us to understand the undertaking of what an eldership is as elders, as members, as and as soon to be deacons. It's not just a select people, it's all people of this church, Lord. And we look forward to that day. So I just pray that you will help us to each. Mold our hearts, put us in the fire, and make us sharper for you, Lord. Because that's what's going to happen. Help us to be open to doing things that we may not be comfortable with doing. But it's not because of my discomfort. It's because of you asking us to step out and bring people to the gospel. We love you, Father. We thank you for Jesus. We, we each every day is as a new day, and we struggle. Some of us are struggling. Whether it's health or finances or just the, the overall stress of, of life, but you are a constant, Lord. And I just pray that you help us remember that your beacon is inside of us glowing. And in the pain and the suffering that we do have, you are the comfort. You are the peace. You let us never forget that. And the thing is, Lord, that peace and the comfort that we can feel from you is allowed for everybody. Help us to show that to everybody, Lord. Be with us today. Help us to worship you like we've not worshipped. We love you, Father. Forgive us as we strive to be like you every day. Forgive us because we are trying. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Sarah herself received ability to conceive. By faith, 
Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of his sons. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus to his sons of Israel. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown, grown up, refused to be called the son of, son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab, the harlot, did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had become, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. By faith, conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promise, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness they were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they may obtain a better resurrection.
to see everybody here, especially you, Dave. Welcome. This is a uh, time that we remember Jesus' instructions. And when he was having his last supper before he was finished his work on the cross, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had thanked God for it, he broke it apart and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And then a little while later, he gave them a glass of wine, saying, This wine is the token of God's new agreement to save you. An agreement sealed with the blood I shall pour out to purchase back your souls. So, to help us think about Jesus a little bit more before we... We uh, follow this example. Let me read the 23rd Psalm that describes our Good Shepherd's tender love and care for each of us. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in the meadow grass and leads me beside the quiet streams. He restores my failing health. He helps me to do what honors him the most. And even when walking through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, guarding guiding all the way. You provide delicious food for me in the presence of my enemies. You have welcomed me as your guest. Blessings overflow. Your goodness and unfailing kindness shall be with me all of my life, and afterwards I will live with you forever in your Sometimes when I'm reading the 23rd Psalm, I get to wondering as if uh, when the Spirit of Christ was inspiring David to write this, that maybe he, Jesus, was looking ahead a little bit to the predestined time that he would leave his proper and rightful place in heaven at the right hand of the Father in order to take on human form, in order to die and to live, to live and die in the valley where sin and death rule. And the past couple of months we've been focusing on that day when Jesus arrived. 100% human and 100% Deity, all in one newborn child. And God had to come to earth in human form because only then could he crush the power of sin and death. And Hebrews chapter 2 kind of explains some of that. It says, since we God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood too by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die, and in dying, break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in that way could he deliver those who, through fear of death, have been living all their lives as slaves to constant dread. And it was necessary for Jesus to be like us, his brothers, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, a priest who would be both merciful to us 
and faithful to God in dealing with the sins of the people. For since he himself has now been through suffering and temptation, he knows what it is like when we suffer and are tempted, and is wonderfully able to help us. So, when we pass the bread out, and you take a piece of bread and break it, keep in mind that when Christ's body was torn and broken, the enemy's power of death was broken. And then when we swallow the bread, remember that the same Holy Spirit that inspired David lives in us only because of God's loving kindness. Let's offer a prayer for the, for the bread. Dear Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise for your goodness and kindness and your faithfulness. We ask you to bless this bread that reminds us of how much you really love us, that you would do all that on our behalf. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 9, verse 11, there's a writing that I, I like to read a lot for communion. It says, Jesus came as high priest of this better system, which we now have. He went into the greater perfect tabernacle in heaven, not made by men nor part of this once for all took blood into that inner room, the Holy of Holies, and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. But it was not the blood of goats and calves. No, he took his own blood, and with it he, by
by himself made sure of our eternal salvation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, as we think about your pure and sinless blood that was poured out on that day on our behalf, we just give you thanks and we give you praise. We ask you to bless this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. normally pass the contribution plates anymore. We uh, just have a container box in the back for people to, that wish to give their offerings in that way. So, but we're so blessed. Let's just offer a prayer and thanks for our blessings and, and for the for blessing that the offerings. Dear Lord, we know that we are so blessed by you in every way. Thank you that you, for your continual flow of blessings, help us to, to give back to you in a worthy manner, that we do it because we want to, not because we have to. We just ask you to bless our efforts, bless the contributions that come in, that they are used for your glory and honor. Pray in Jesus' name.
child. Think you're a child. Act like a child. <laughs> now is the time for Children's Church. If you would uh, make your way quietly and orderly towards the back, Ms. Laura is there to greet you and help you down the stairs.
Faced with difficulties regarding the rented houses where the children lived, he dreamed of building an orphan's home of his own, on his own land, with every amenity. It took 18 months to amass the initial sum of money. And throughout that time, George counted the days he spent in prayer and reported the funds as they trickled in, each donation. God's answer to his prayer, rather than the fruit of a plea to man for money, spurred by the spurred him on to continue. Eventually, he built five homes, costing more than $100,000 to build, which is over $14 million in today's currency. You can read from his memoirs all the prayers that he offered, the needs that were given that he never asked anyone for anything, and how every time God answered with what they needed, not what they wanted, but what they needed. And that orphanage was able to care for hundreds and hundreds of children. I think he's a shining, shining, excuse me, a shining example for us. He stepped out in faith. And God answered. And by looking at it in a big way. Imagine. $14 million donations coming in over 18 months for us to build a building that we never asked anyone for. But we just pray for it. God can and will deliver. I want to talk about faith. This year, uh, I've chosen the idea of faith. And our phrase is faith facing forward. Faith facing forward. This year, I want us to step out of faith. This year, I want us to not worry about what we can do, what we've done, what we don't have, and simply rely on God and pray to give us what we need. To lead us in that direction, to guide us. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Indiana Jones, right? Pretty much everyone. Not seeing a lot of head shaking. You guys know Indiana Jones? Yes. yes. Okay. The second movie, no, third movie, third movie. Uh, something for say. The Last uh, Crusade. What is it? Last, Last Crusade. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in that, there's a scene where there's this chasm, right? And I think the, the, the trial that he has to go through is the leap of faith. And you see him standing on the edge, and he's wrestling. Do I step? Do I jump? What, what do I do? And eventually he kind of lets go, and he takes his foot out, and he steps forward. And there, somehow hidden, was a bridge that he is able to then cross. I want to propose to you that our walk of faith starts the same way. With a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of fear and anxiety. But it's up to us to take the first step. <clears throat> so I want to look at faith. <clears throat> faith is one of the basic tenets of Christianity. But I question sometimes, do we really understand faith? We use the word, we throw the word around, and, 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 and in ways we do, but I think not in its totality. So I want to take a little bit of time and just kind of focus on and look at faith. <clears throat> I always wrestle with, you know, if someone from the street asked me, well, what is faith? How do I describe it? How do I tell somebody what faith is who doesn't believe in God? We have faith in all kinds of things, right? Every time you step onto a plane or a boat, you have faith that that plane's going to fly and that the captain knows what he's doing and that the boat's not going to sink. And, and we have faith in all kinds of things. Faith, trust, right? <clears throat> we'll look at some of the other words. word. <clears throat> but how do we respond? How do we describe faith to someone? How would you describe faith? We know from Hebrews chapter 1, it says, Now faith 
is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This gives us a Hellenistic, biblical understanding of the word faith, or pistos in Greek. It tends to appear in legal documents, carrying the meaning of a guarantee or security. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it often replaces the word, mm, I don't know how to say that, it's just M and N, which means faithfulness or trueness. We also learn in, sorry, oh, we also learn in verse 2 of Hebrews, For by it men of old gained approval. By what? By their faith. What faith? Faith in what they could not see. They had trust in God to deliver them. If you look at Abraham, <clears throat> when he takes Isaac up to the sacrifice, in Genesis chapter 2, or excuse me, uh, Genesis 22, eight, or 1 through 18, we see God speaking to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, up to the mountain and their sacrifice. I'm paraphrasing. <clears throat> so Abraham gets his son, the servant, loads the donkey with everything that they're going to need, and they take off. And when they get there, they start to set up the altar. And then Abraham takes his son, binds him, lays him on the altar. Now we learn from Hebrews <clears throat> that he knew that God could raise him even from the dead. See, Abraham had faith, trust, a guarantee in God. See, God had promised Abraham that through his son Isaac, the world would be blessed. And how could God, who made that promise, then kill the promise that he gave? Abraham stepped out in faith, knowing that God would deliver. And God did, right? A ram is found in the thicket and replaces Isaac on the altar. <clears throat> Sarah and Abraham were promised a son. That took a long time. 25 years. 25 years from the time that they were promised a son to its actual fulfillment. And in that time, Sarah thought, hey, this is taking too long. I'm going to help God out. I've got this handmaid. Let me take Hagar, and we'll have a son through him. And maybe that's what God wanted, and that's how we'll see it. See, she started to infringe upon God's plan. She started to take under her own counsel how God's plan was going to be enacted and how it would be carried out. And we know that didn't turn out so well, right? We still feel some of that today. So God gives us plan. God gives us <clears throat> his word. It's up to us to have faith to see it through. The hard part in that is that we're not guaranteed a seat at the table for that event. See, as we look at the future, as we start to look out and we go, where in faith is God going to lead us? I may not get to see that day. I don't know what God has in store for here. But I know that God is faithful. I know that God is always working for the betterment of his people. And I know that God's church will never see defeat. So I know that this church is going to continue on. I know that his lighthouse here is going to continue on in a big way. I just don't know exactly what that looks like. But I want to invite all of you to step out in faith that God is going to deliver on the promises that he has made. <clears throat> faith, oh, those promises may take five. 10, 25 years. That's okay. One of the hard parts for us is realizing that we are not the star in the show. We're the side characters. We're walk-ons. We're extras. Sometimes we, 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 we get to say a line. But the story's not about us. 
And the more we can realize that, the more we can understand that and accept that this is God's production, and we are just the people that are helping to put it on and to, to, to demonstrate it, to show it. <clears throat> the less it takes, or the more it takes off of us. You understand what I'm saying? It's not determinant on us. We're not Sarah. We don't have to go, I know God's going to do great things here. Now I've got an idea. Let's go and do what I want to do. Now I'm not saying that God didn't give you that idea. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to allow God to work. We have to allow his faith, our faith in him to carry out that plan. God is going to work through his people because that's what he does. Right? He, throughout history, has taken the, the lowest, the, the, the meat, the, the, the one that we wouldn't go, hey, let's follow this guy. Because it's a demonstration of his power when that is when that takes place, right? We were talking about Gideon this morning in our Bible class. Gideon's like, when the angel of the Lord appeared, he's like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the least of all in, in my father's house. And, uh, oh, thank you. God uses Gideon to deliver his people. Right? When, 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 when Israel was clamoring for a king, right? When they're like, we want a king. God's like, you don't know what you're asking for. We want a king. Samuel's like, what, what do we do? God's like, give them what they want. So they look around and they find Saul, who's tall, strong, what you would picture and think of as a king. And the people are like, yeah, we want Saul. Right? We do that, don't we? We're like, I want to follow that guy, not that guy. But God says, follow that guy and see what I can do. Follow the guy that you don't think is going to be able to do it. The guy that you look upon and go, eh, no. And see what not he can do, but what he can do. God is going to do amazing things here. Because this isn't my church. It's not your church. Truth be told, it's not our church. This is Jesus' church. This is his body. This is his bride. And so however God leads us and however God directs that, we have to have the faith, the trust, to be led by God. We're not always good at being led. Right? Because we want that guy, not that guy. <clears throat> we have to have the faith to move forward, not to try to take shortcuts like Sarah did. <clears throat> now, faith has dimensions to it. The first is covenantal. It's not really a word. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, the idea of faith is tied to covenant language, right? You are faithful to the covenant. You are putting your trust in the covenant. You are adhering and keeping to the terms of the covenant. And faith is often interchanged, inter interchanged dispersed with those words. So the idea of faith, of having trust and commitment, is tied to covenant. Now, we don't talk about covenant nearly enough. But folks, if you are in Christ, you are in a covenant relationship with God. Did you know that? When you are baptized into Christ, you are clothing yourself with Christ, and you are entering into a covenant relationship, just like the people that the Israelites did. Now, they were born into covenant relationship. We choose covenant relationship. We become the dwelling place, the tabernacle for God. <clears throat> Us, the individuals. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Old Testament is all about covenant relationship and keeping the terms of the covenant. <clears throat> it's not merely a cognitive exercise, that, but carries an expectation of finality and truth. We see this carried out in Joshua 24:14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. 
and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt, and serve the Lord. The word truth there, uh, here is rendered by the NSBS, or NAS, NASB um, as truth. In other, in other translations, like the NRSB, uh, it's translated faithfulness. Those words are interchanged. And when you look at it, it's the word pistos, faith, trust. <clears throat> We often <clears throat> shy away from the idea of covenant because I think we realize that there's limitations and constrictions and there's obligations. When we are in Christ, we are obligated to keep the terms of the covenant. The second is epistemological epistemological thing. <laughs> Big words, I know. <clears throat> this covers the learned part of faith. Epistemology is, uh, relates to knowledge and how we get it, and the difference between belief and opinion. Paul tells us that we're not to have blind faith, but rather that we ought to have a reason. When we have a blind faith, we just say, I just believe because I believe. There's no sustenance. There's nothing that anchors us and holds us in that belief. It's the same as, you know, you respond emotionally to Christ. You're, you're at camp or you're, you're somewhere and there's all this stuff going on and there's all this excitement and there's this emotional draw. And you're like, oh, I want to give myself to Christ. And you're, you're responding to an emotional, from an, an emotional place. That's awesome. The problem is, is that when the storms come, when that high comes down, when you're challenged, there's no substance for you to hold on to. It's as if you are on the sinking sand. But when you respond intellectually, when you have a reasoned faith, when you look at the evidence and go, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe in the words of the Bible. I believe in God. And these are the reasons why. I can look at eyewitness accounts. It's not just, it just makes me feel good. It's, I can look at eyewitness accounts, historical documents, and go, this man Jesus lived. This man claimed to be God. He performed miracles. People saw him. People saw him arrested, crucified, and raised again. I have their eyewitness accounts. I believe what they say to be true. You know, Jesus prayed for you, right? John chapter 20. Because of that. Those who believe. <clears throat> that coupled with an emotional response is what God is after. Because we have to respond to him both intellectually and emotionally. And so God, or excuse me, Paul doesn't want us to just have this blind faith that we just follow willy-nilly because that's what everyone else is doing. Because he knows that there's nothing that will anchor and hold you. So our faith, rather, ought to be reasoned. So we have to have this faith that is rooted in learning and, and understanding and reasoning through who God is, what he has promised me, what the terms of the covenant are, what all the pieces and parts that I'm accepting, that I am stepping into. <clears throat> so we have this idea of covenant. We have this idea of a learned faith. But there's also the eschatological faith. Eschatologically. Eschatology. See, I'm not going to use words. So don't feel bad if you don't know either. <clears throat> it's the study of death or judgment or of the end times. We have faith in where we're going based on the promises of God. Our faith or trust is not seen in the presence only. We know that this world is corrupt from Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32. God promises that all that is hidden will be, re be, relieved, be revealed in the end. Part of our faith is trusting in the promises that God gave us. That, that the truth will be revealed. That when Jesus returns, we will be taken with him. He is preparing a place for us. We have faith in that. So we have this idea of covenantal, coven, coven, covenant. We have this idea of learned Faith, and we have this idea of future faith, or our, 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 our faith in what is to come. 
Though faith has many parts, ultimately it boils down to, in my opinion, trust. When we, when we talk about faith, do I have trust in the Lord? Is my trust enough? Is my faith enough? And so as we start to look and think about ourselves and facing our faith facing forward, do we have trust in the Lord enough to take that step? Do we have trust enough in the Lord, in his promises, in what he has told us, in who he is, to step into the unknown? Now that's scary, isn't it? It's hard to step into something that you don't know. It's imagine if, if we're all standing on that ledge. Harrison Ford's right next to me because he's cool. And I want to stand next to him. <laughs> but we're all lined up. Who's going to take the step, the step first? Are you waiting? Are you waiting for someone else to take the step? That works. <laughs> but, 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 but really, are you waiting for someone else to take the step? To step out in faith? To go, oh, there is something there. It's okay. Okay, now we can move forward. I want to propose to you that we ought to not wait for someone else to step because guess what? <laughs> we're going to just keep right on waiting. Because we're just going to keep looking down the line. <laughs> I'm not really sure, so I'm just going to wait for somebody else to. But what if we, together, all stepped at the same time? What if we had enough trust in God and in each other that we all just stepped forward? What would happen? I don't know. Is the, is, is the bridge that wide? point of it is, is that we're stepping together in faith in God. That's what George did. He stepped in faith. He said, I'm not going to take a salary. I'm not going to ask for money. I'm going to pray to God. And I believe in the heart of my heart. I trust in God. My faith is such that I know God is going to deliver. What if we did that here? What if over this year, we started to step out in faith. Not knowing exactly, exactly where we're being led. But we started to step out into faith and see where God is taking us. Now, I don't know what it looks like. But I do know that God is already leading us. You know, it wasn't too long ago. When there was half the seats again. It wasn't too long ago when the atmosphere was a little down. Can we be honest? And then God started to move things. I'm a firm believer that God orchestrates our lives. And God started to remind us that he's here. Two years ago, had we said, hey, let's go out and feed some homeless folks. I don't know that it could have happened. I imagine it would be, well, we don't really have people for that. And we don't know what that's going to look like. We can't. We just don't have the, whatever. Fill the blank. But God. I love that. But God. God brought us a family with something on their heart. And led them into a ministry. That has brought us to Tyler. And others. My God. See, God is already active. He's already moving. He's already directing us. We just have to stop standing on the way. And I don't know if it means we need to lock arms or whatever, but we need to step out in faith. We need to step 
step out in faith in all aspects of our lives. It's not enough to come here Sunday morning. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. God does not want you for one hour a week. God wants you 24-7. That means we are always on mission. Every one of us. It's not just because I'm here or someone else. We are all called to mission. If you are in Christ, you are called to action. You are a soldier. You are issued gear. Get it dirty. Start putting it to work. Doesn't matter how young you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. We can all serve. We can all participate in what God is doing. Maybe it's writing a check. Maybe it's making some soup. Maybe it's cleaning this or picking up after that or, or, or seeing a need and filling it. I don't know. But God does. And God needs you, his people, to be on the move. So we need to take our faith and we need to start facing forward. And we need to start taking steps. The biggest journey ever, right? How does it begin? One step. No matter what we do, no matter where we're going, it, ha it takes a step. We have to step into that. And sometimes it's the unknown, and the unknown is scary. And we can come up with a thousand different reasons why we ought not step forward. Right? I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. We don't have the people. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't have, we don't, I don't, you didn't. Do you ever notice what's in that? Me, I, not God. But God can. <laughs> right? As, as we start to look, and what is God going to do? Where is God going to lead this congregation in 2024? We need to not go, oh, we can't, or we haven't, or we tried, and it didn't. We need to go, where is God leading us, and how do we move forward? Right. Not, do we have the money? Do we have this? Do we have that? Is everything in place? Some of us are planners. Some of us want to make sure everything's perfect. I like to think and plan, sometimes to my own detriment, where I just don't move forward because I'm still thinking about everything. That's good. We need that. We need all the different parts and pieces. We need people thinking and planning. But we need people who are willing to step forward off the ledge first and say, let's go. Grabbing each other's hands so that we can get to work. Whether it be by our giving, by our service, by our hospitality, whatever it is, we are all called to be moving forward. Because if we do, there's nothing that can stop us. We know that the gates of Hades cannot overcome this church. The only thing that can defeat this church is us. When we give up, when we become complacent, when we get comfortable... God's word slows down. So I want to challenge you to grab hands, to lock arms, to step up to the edge, and step out in faith. We're going to spend the next year talking about faith a lot. We did some last year and the year before. But I want this year to be our year of faith. I want uh, this year to be our year where we step out and we allow God to lead us, to supply. And if, if there's something we're like, how, how are we going to do this? I want to challenge you to stop right there and go, no. It's not how am I going to do this or how are we going to do this. I want to challenge you to call up your friends, your neighbors talking about y'all, and start praying and say, God, here's a need. It's your will to supply it. So that it's not determinant on us to go, oh, we need to raise $5,000 for that thing. No, we say, God, we're going to pray and we're going to have faith and trust in you to supply that need. And then, folks, God's already doing it. That's the thing I want to impress upon you. God is already doing it. And if you don't recognize that, just look around. God is already at work. All we have to do is get up. Get off the bench. And step into the unknown. Some of you are. 
some of you are on the fence, some of you are questioning, what do I do? How do I do that? You want the answer? Just step forward. Just step forward. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. I don't know. My life is a series of I don't knows and stepping forward. Most of you know our story. Uh, when we left for Texas, woo, I didn't know where we were going to live. I didn't know if we were going to have any support. I didn't, we didn't know anything. We came to this congregation and said, this is where we think we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do and go. And this congregation was like, well, we don't know really either, and so let's figure it out. And you guys helped us with some funds to get there. And that's about all we had when we left. When we rolled into to Lubbock, I'll be honest with you, I was like, we're leaving. We rolled in, it was 103 degrees. I don't like the heat. 103 degrees. And we pulled into the wrong side of Lubbock. The east side. And we pulled into this Taco Bell. It's 103 degrees. And we go in. And I'm like, honey, we got to be. We're going home. This is, this is awful. We made a mistake. She's like, whoa. So she gets on her phone, right? And then she, she looks and she's like, hey, there's a, there's a Costco here. I was like, oh, okay, that's nice. And she's like, wait, it's even better. There's a Cabela's right next to it. <laughs> okay, I think I think we can try this, right? And so we call up the school. We go and we meet Speedy. He's the guy, uh, great guy. He said, "Just come. Don't worry about it. God, God will figure it out. You just come." And so we stepped in faith and said, "Okay." Our whole time in Texas was a series of. <coughs> I, I don't know how what we're gonna eat. Just like George. I, I don't know what we're going to do tomorrow. I, I don't know how we're going to pay that bill. And without fail, man, without fail, we would go to the post office and there'd be a check or something. I, I wish Virginia and Lynn were still here because there was one time when we were like, I don't really know what we're going to do right now. And there was a check for $100. And that got us through. And I can never give them enough words of appreciation for what that meant. So it's going to be scary. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. But if we step in faith, God is good. Amen. And God will supply what we need. We may have big dreams, and we may think we're going to build a skyscraper. And we may work towards that, and God's going to be like, you know, let me just turn you back over here. That's okay. Folks, there's going to be times when we are going to fail. We are going to step out, and we're like, this is what we should do, and we're going to go for it. And it's going to fail. That is okay. Because we learn from that failure and we redirect and we keep figuring things out and we keep stepping forward no matter what happens to us because the world is going to want to shut us down. The world is going to want to stop us. The world is going to continue to tell us you can't do it. You won't do it. You're not good enough. You don't know enough. But God. But All we have to do is follow him. <clears throat> so stepping out can be scary. It can be hard to be alone. we got to remember we're not alone. If we all step together, we may fall, but we can pick each other up. As long as we're moving forward, as long as we are allowing God to lead us and to mold us, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish through him. Our job is to accomplish God's mission, which is to sow seed. To give everyone an opportunity to respond to the gospel message. Because even here, in the Northwest, which I'll, I'll give you honest, the people down south think that we live in like Keysville. Like this is, we live in 
of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe some truth in that. <clears throat> but a lot of them think it's not worth it. A lot of, a lot of people think, when we were starting the, the church plant in West Seattle, a lot of people were like, yeah, no, that's not going to work. Nobody up there wants to hear about Jesus. Nobody cares about the gospel up there. Like, they think that all the churches here on life support and, and the, the church is dying in the Northwest. I don't think that can be further from the truth. I think we've gone through some valleys. I think we've, we've, we've taken some lumps and some bruises. But God always, listen to me, God always leaves a remnant for a time such as this. Amen. This is our time. This is our time to be rekindled, to be re refreshed, renewed, to step out in faith and see what God can do in this place. Because there are folks here, even like Jonah and Nineveh. There's folks who will respond. There are folks who still need Jesus. And our job is to let them hear about him, to give them an opportunity. <clears throat> So my question to you is, what's holding you back? What's keeping you from stepping forward, stepping out? <clears throat> Jesus needs us, needs all of us. You know, you can't outgive God. Did you know that? You can't outserve God. I want to leave you with three things. Number one, I want to challenge you to look inwardly and be honest with yourself and recognize what's holding you back. What's keeping you from serving, doing, from whatever it is. And really look at that. Acknowledge it. Number two, see where God is pointing you and set your sights on that. See what direction God is calling it. The beautiful thing is that with the body and all the different parts and functions and pieces, we all have different jobs to do. We all have different talents and gifts. We don't all have to go out and drive a mercy mobile. <clears throat> Because actually, if you do, you have to fill out this thing for Gary. That's right. That's all that. So, just a little thing there in case you want. <clears throat> but, but we're all we're all different. So where is God pointing you? Set your sights on that and take that first step. That's that's number three. By the way, just take the step. I don't know what that is for you, individually. Individually, you got to look inwardly, be honest, and see where you, what you need to do. What's holding you back? Then look and see where God is trying to lead you. Because I, 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 I would propose to you that God is, is tugging and, 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 and shifting. Have you ever heard of like, like ducks and chickens, right? You just kind of wave your hand a little bit and then they start to, to move. That's what God does for us. He kind of gives us a little, little this. Sometimes he got smacked upside the head. Right? You got lumps like me, you know. Right? Where is God directing you? Set your sights on that. And just take the first step. We don't, it's not, it's not a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's a it's a marathon. Right? It's not, oh God wants me to do that. I gotta get there as fast as I can. Folks, it may take 20 years. 30 years. It may take your whole lifetime. Hear me. That is oh. Okay. Did you hear me? That is okay. As long as you are keeping moving forward. We all are at different paces. Some of us run faster than others. That's okay. Because if we're all going forward, we're all moving together, we can help each other along the way. Amen. <clears throat> If we start stepping together in faith, then we can move mountains. We can change hearts. 
we can start the journey to where God needs us to be. We're his remnant for this time. So I want to encourage you to start stepping in faith and allow God to lead. If you're here this morning and you need to respond to the message, if you've not been baptized into Christ, uh, if you've got questions about that, I'd love to answer them as best I can. I'm not, I'll be honest, I don't know all the answers. We have a God that supplies. If you need prayers, we're a, we're, we are a body that, that, that does life together. You know, if you're struggling, let people pray for you. Let us, let us come and bend the knee beside you. Because it's not about how you are going to or I am going to solve any situation. It's but God. And when we invite God into the equation, man, look out. It's going to be a skyscraper right over there. Or maybe it's over there. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I don't know what's going to look like. <laughs> There's lots of things. And if you need to respond to the message today, then I want to invite you during our song of invitation to come forward uh, to either clothe yourself with Christ in baptism or just ask for prayers. Let's stand and sing. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that finds peace to abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus is with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus is with me, I'll go
realm to be your instrument, you know, to bring uh, hope and light and life to wherever she goes and to the people that she comes into contact with. And so, God, use us up mightily. When we're done, call us home. In your son's name we pray. <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, and Heather's going to be in the back of the cab with a sign up sheet. Uh, if, if anyone is interested in helping with the Mercy Mobile with meals or going or any of that, uh, talk to her.
few minutes, I promise. There are planners in the congregation, and um, the budget team has prepared the 2024 budget based on information that was gathered from all of the ministries of this church. And we are excited about 2024 because it's going to be a great year. I love the story about George Mueller and the way he lived his life in prayer to God to provide whatever he needed. And I believe this congregation will also be in prayer about this church and moving forward and will deliver the contributions that we need for the 2024 budget. The budget says we need to spend about 30% more in 2024 than we spent in 2023. 30% more. That's a lot. But you know what? In 2023, we asked you to do 30% more. We asked you to do 30% more. And you did more than that. Contribution for more in 23 than we budgeted. God is good. Let me just tell you a couple things about the 24 budget. Our preschool attendance is up to eight, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Preschool is moving on. We're hiring a part-time secretary in 2024 to do more administrative things that we need done. We plan to spend about $6,800 to upgrade our ability to live stream our worship service so it can be better for those on the outside that can't attend. That's a great thing. We have money in the budget for 2024 so that our youth can go to many, many outings. The youth in our congregation is our future. Amen? We're going to give a one-time contribution of $5,000 to Delano Bay to help them complete the new facility out there. And other congregations that use that facility have also been asked to do the same thing. Delano Bay is a great thing, and we've supported that for years. And so, blessings on Delano Bay. That's all I have. There are budget sheets on the table in the back, and you are welcome to get a copy of that and take a look. If you have questions, ask any of the budget team. Um, and um, blessings for 2024. Let's move forward. Thank <clears throat> you. 